Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Immunolabeling for Neurodegenerative Diseases. My name is Vicki, and I will be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and if you do require any assistance, please feel free to contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I would like to thank Cell Signaling Technology, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Cell Signaling Technology, or CST, is a private, family-owned company founded by scientists and dedicated to providing high-quality research tools to the biomedical research community. Their employees operate worldwide from their U.S. headquarters in Massachusetts and their offices in the Netherlands, China, and Japan. And now, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Dr. Li Wei Tsai. Dr. Tsai received her Ph.D. degree from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas. She then took postdoctoral training from Ed Harlow's laboratory at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and Massachusetts General Hospital. She joined the faculty in the Department, Department of Pathology at Harvard Medical School in 1994 and was named an investigator of Howard Hughes Medical Institute in 1997. In 2006, she was appointed professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences and is currently the director of the Pekauer Institute for Learning and Memory at MIT. And our second speaker for today is Dr. Raphael Rosenfeld. Dr. Rosenfeld is in charge of the neuroscience antibody portfolio at CST. He has been at CST for over four years and contributes to the scientific direction of neuroscience product development. He has produced over 110 antibodies in the fields of neuroscience and membrane proteins. And before that, Raphael was a researcher at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where he studied the role of protein homeostasis in liver fibrosis and the impact of G-protein coupled receptor heteromerization on receptor-mediated signaling in disease. His work was internationally recognized as demonstrated by publications in high-impact journals and invitations to present at the 2010 Cannabinoids in Biology and Medicine Workshop and at the 2011 Experimental Biology Conference, as well as invitations to contribute book chapters and reviews in prestigious journals such as the Trends in Pharmacological Sciences and Biochemical Journal. Raphael obtained his PhD and PharmD from University of Paris, France. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to Dr. Sai and Dr. Rosenfeld. You may begin when ready. Okay. Um, can you hear me, everybody? This is Li Wei Tai. Yes, Dr. Sai, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, can you see my first slide? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so today I plan to um, uh, show you some results uh, from our effort uh, over the years to study um, Alzheimer's disease, and in particular, um, the various um, immunolabeling um, approaches we use to learn about the pathophysiology of the disease and potential um, targets for therapeutic intervention. So um, Alzheimer's disease, as everybody knows, is a huge problem uh, of this century and um, it's a complex disorder and currently there is um, no cure and there is no agent that can even um, significantly delay um, uh, or, uh, the, the disease or ameliorate the devastating symptoms, which um, obviously involves 
cognitive decline and eventually um, dementia. But we do know a lot about the, um, the features of the pathology of the disease. So Alzheimer's is, um, other than the symptoms, is very much defined by the abundant uh, deposition of the so-called amyloid flux. So these are extracellular deposition of beta amyloid peptides. And the patient's brain also um, contain numerous um, neurofibrillary tingles. These are uh, um, intracellular aggregation of the um, hyperphosphorylated microtubule binding protein tau. And um, at some point, uh, these patients suffer uh, severe neuronal loss or death of neurons, therefore results in reduced brain volume and uh, synaptic loss, as well as um, a marked uh, neuroinflammatory um, response. So um, currently, um, the major um, knowledge in terms of the pathogenesis of the disease is um, from uh, the uh, genetics of Alzheimer's, especially those people who have uh, this uh, inheritable form of the disease known as familial Alzheimer's. Um, three human genes have been identified with mutations that will cause Alzheimer's disease sometime very uh, early onset. And these genes are um, uh, amyloid precursor protein gene, APP, presenolin 1 and presenolin 2. And over the years, a lot of elegant studies have been done and um, that led to uh, the realization that, um, that um, production or accumulation of the amyloid peptides really play a very uh, early um, and causative role in the cascade of events leading to um, 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 multiple um, uh, outcomes, including um, 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 alteration in intracellular signaling pathway, altered synaptic function, neuronal loss, and cognitive dysfunction. And in terms of sporadic Alzheimer's disease, now there are also major genetic risk factors that have been identified. Um, the, the best known one is uh, the uh, apolipoprotein E, um, um, E4, uh, isoform, which um, is speculated to um, regulate the clearance of amyloid from the brain. And with the E4 allele, the clearance is um, impaired, and that can also lead to increased beta amyloid and feeding into these um, uh, signaling cascades. So, um, so over the years, many animal models have been uh, created um, to study the disease. Here I'm showing you um, the uh, pathology uh, exhibited by uh, the so-called 5XFAD uh, transgenic uh, uh, Alzheimer's mouse model. This mouse was created by uh, Professor Bob Wasser's laboratory at Northwestern University. The mice um, overexpressed five different alleles of uh, familial Alzheimer's disease mutations and the APP and presenolin 1 genes. And um, the mice uh, show very aggressive uh, pathology in terms of um, amyloid um, deposition, as you can see from uh, the image here. Um, even as early as two months um, uh, of age, you can already see the deposition of amyloid um, in parts of the brain, and um, the pathology progresses, and uh, by six to nine months, um, you can already see very overt amyloid deposition um, throughout the brain. And this mice also show uh, reactive extragliosis, as shown by the GFAP, immunohistochemistry, as well as um, uh, microglia activation. So this is a very robust uh, mouse model. And there are also multiple uh, mouse models created for, uh, for neurofibrillary tangles. So here I'm showing you uh, a model created by Professor Virginia Lee, John Trojanowski's laboratory. Um, they created the so-called uh, tau P301S uh, tauopathy 
mouse model, and this is a, um, a familial mutation identified in human patients uh, with frontal temporal dementia. So um, here, uh, I think you can appreciate using um, different fossil tau antibodies, you can see a progressive um, increase in um, phospho tau immunohistochemistry uh, in uh, the hippocampus. Here you can see um, the signal increases in the stomatodendritic compartment of neurons, which is um, really the sign of um, pathology because tau is well known to be a exonal specific uh, microtubule specific protein. So during the um, um, neurodegeneration, tau protein apparently um, relocalized to a different compartment um, in the brain, as you see uh, in panel A and B. And in panel C and E, using different kind of staining, such as silver impregnation or sour flaking S, um, very well uh, established method to look at um, uh, aggregated um, um, pair helical filament like precipitation of the tau protein um, in neurons. And um, in panel e and F, panels E and F, um, you can see using ultrastructural analysis, electron microscopy, um, and, uh, and you can see this little gold particle. So this is immuno EM um, labeling phospho tau, um, decorating uh, this filamental structure. So, so this mouse model is a very robust um, uh, model for, uh, for neurofibrillary tingle or tau pussy. And the third model I would like to introduce um, is a model created in my own laboratory. Um, this is known as the inducible CKP25 mouse model. So, um, so P25 is a pathological um, activator of a protein kinase known as CDK5. And uh, we and others have previously shown that CDK5 catalytic activity is dysregulated in that it's hyperactive in, um, in human brain samples of Alzheimer's and, um, and in mouse models of um, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, P25 is the protein that can cause hyperactivation of CDK5. So, um, so we created a title promoter driven P25 GFP and crossed the line with the Kim kinase 2 TTA. So in the bitransgenic, in the presence of doxycycline, P25 transgene is not expressed. But once we um, take the doxycycline off from their diet, then P25 transgene is rapidly um, induced. So we found that these animals uh, show striking neurodegeneration and neuronal loss. If you look at the upper right-hand panel uh, um, of the uh, slide, you can see that um, you can see the full brain volume uh, of the mouse brain is drastically reduced and um, also neuronal density in the cortex and in the hippocampus. Um, so uh, cortex hippocampus here, you can see hippocampus volume is also uh, reduced with reduced neuronal density. These animals show um, uh, increased beta amyloid um, uh, accumulation and we can, by uh, EM, we can also see aggregated form of amyloid as well as uh, tau, tau pussy. And these animals also have increased inflammation in the brain, reduced synaptic density as shown by uh, synaptophysing staining and reduced dendritic uh, volume as shown by MAP2 immunohistochemistry. So, um, so one thing very interesting that we found early on is that we were curious to know before the onset of uh, neurodegeneration and neuronal loss, um, we wanted to know whether there are already um, pathological changes in um, neurons um, in the CKP25 mice. So, um, so we took the uh, pre-symptomatic um, animals, which is uh, two weeks after P25 induction. And uh, through a series of experiments, we realized that the hippocampal neurons of these animals um, show um, abnormal uh, cell cycle reentry. 
So here, you, using KI67, which is a cell cycle marker, we can now label many neurons in um, the CA1 of the mouse. And furthermore, using gamma H2AX, which is a very well marker for DNA double-stranded breaks. And we were really surprised to see that multiple, just many, many hippocampal neurons now are positive for gamma H2AX. So we know that in the presymptomatic stage of the animals, um, hippocampal neurons already show very abnormal um, phenotypes, including um, cell cycle uh, gene reactivation and DNA double stranded breaks, and um, and this is not observed in the control um, animals. So um, so one thing uh, we um, have been trying to do is to see what's the consequence uh, of um, um, blocking um, the um, um, development of uh, DNA double-stranded breaks. So um, to cut a long story short, we found that um, one of the Sir Chewing family member, Sir T1, um, plays a very important role in repairing DNA damage. So we were able to get our hands on um, a pharmacological activator of uh, Sir T1, uh, the acetylase. And we treated the uh, CKP25 mice with um, this um, chemical activator of um, 31 And uh, we found that this treatment successfully reduced the number of neurons positive for gamma H2AX in the CKP25 animals. And, uh, and what's um, really um, very encouraging is that this reduction of gamma H2AX signal is accompanied by increase in um, the new M positive um, um, neurons um, in the um, activator treated uh, group. So, uh, so it seems that reducing DNA damage um, is associated with increased neuronal survival. So, indicating that uh, DNA double stranded break uh, pathology um, could be an early sign of neuronal demise. And this is not only true in the CKP25 mice, uh, we found that um, in the tau p 301 s transgenic mouse model, um, in their hippocampi, we also found increase in gamma H2AX um, positive um, uh, neurons. And um, similarly, we treated these mice with um, the uh, 31 chemical activator, and again, we found that this treatment can very efficiently reduce um, gamma H2AX um, signal um, intensity. And um, another um, avenue we try in terms of therapeutics is uh, HDAG inhibitor. So back in 2007, we found that in the CKP25 animals, after they show neurodegeneration, neuronal loss, and um, uh, brain volume loss, um, and they show very impaired learning of memory, as shown by the contextual field conditioning and Moore's water maze behavioral test. After we treated these animals with um, sodium butyrate, which is a non selective H DAG inhibitor, for four weeks, we found even though the brain volume doesn't seem to be significantly um, increased, this treatment um, markedly uh, restored um, uh, hippocampus-dependent learning behavior. And uh, also, this treatment uh, really very uh, dramatically increased synaptic density. So again, this is uh, synaptophysin immunohistochemistry. We look at synaptophysin positive punta as a proxy for uh, synapse. And you can see in the CKP25 mice, synaptic phasin punta is um, very much reduced. But after sodium butyrate treatment, the uh, synaptic density is um, restored. And um, through uh, years of um, uh, experiments, we eventually identify histone deacetylase 2 or HDAC2 is a muscle regulator 
of uh, the expression of learning and memory genes. Um, HDAC2 normally serves as a transcriptional repressor um, of this gene expression by binding to their promoter. And, um, and interestingly, we found in the CKP25 mice, in the hippocampus, HDAC2 um, uh, levels in the, nucle in the nucleus of these neurons is very dramatically increased. And this is very specific to HDAC2. Uh, other HDAC family members, such as HDAC1 and HDAC3, um, don't seem to uh, change their expression levels. And this is also true in post-mortem uh, human Alzheimer's disease brain. So, um, so we uh, obtain um, a very nicely curated, curated set of um, human post-mortem brain samples um, with Alzheimer's disease at different Brock and Brock um, stages and um, compare the HDAC2 level in the control brain versus um, the, uh, various stages of Alzheimer's brain, we found that HDAC2 is um, very much active, um, increased. This is not true for HDAC1 or not true for HDAC3. So again, HDAC2 um, dysregulation is very unique in um, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, we also found that if we can use a small hairpin RNA to knock down HDAC2 expression in the CKP25 hippocampus, here uh, I'm showing you we use a um, uh, recombinant virus to introduce this uh, small hairpin into the hippocampus of the CKP25 mice. And we found that this is sufficient to rescue their learning and memory behavior. And here, again, using synaptophysing staining to look at synaptic density, um, the treated mice show um, restore synaptic density as shown on the histogram here. And also dendritic volume can be fully restored um, by knocking down HDAC2 expression. So, um, so, so um, we recently wanted to know really um, how early we can observe HDAC2 elevation in um, the um, course of um, Alzheimer's disease. So we actually have um, started um, to um, uh, make um, um, uh, induced prepotent stem cells uh, from human uh, Alzheimer's disease subjects. So we took the fibroblasts from the subjects, reprogrammed them, into induced prepotent stem cells, then then we can differentiate these uh, stem cells into um, uh, neurons and uh, other cell type. So here I just want to make the point: um, we we um, differentiate this IPS into neural progenitors. They are not even completely post mitotic yet. But if you look at nuclear HDAC2 levels in the three different familial Alzheimer's disease lines harboring either presenolin mutations or APP duplication, and compare the HDAC2 level to the control subject, again, you can appreciate there is a tremendous uh, increase of HDAC2 level. So, um, so this suggests, suggests to us that HDAC2 elevation um, is a very early sign of the disease. And uh, as I said earlier, HDAC2 elevation leads to uh, uh, enhanced suppression of the expression of learning and memory genes. So this will have um, uh, detrimental consequences on learning and memory. So since my time is running out, I'm gonna skip some slides here and basically just um, go to the last part of my talk. Uh, which is now our new effort in trying to uh, assess the uh, pathology of Alzheimer's disease in a more unbiased uh, global level. So uh, recently there has been this clarity technology being developed to, this, is, this technology was developed to really to map uh, the nervous system in um, normal condition and also in disease conditions. So the first generation of the clarity technology is to use hydrogel monomer to replace the brain's lipid and, um, and this would uh, um, uh, render the brain much more accessible to uh, macromolecule infusion such as uh, antibodies and the brain um, um, is um, uh, accessible to multiple rounds of antibody labeling 
and then after the labeling with um, uh, emerging the brain in the index matching solution, uh, which would uh, render the brain completely uh, transparent. So, um, so this is just a um, a movie produced by Kwang Hong Chang, who was involved in the development of the technology when he was in. Um, uh, Carl Dysoras lab at uh, Stanford University in Kwang Hung now is a faculty at the Picard Institute for Learning and Memory and um, he uses technology to image the whole um, uh, brain of a GFP mouse and you can see the, the, the green neurons as well as the, um, the axonal fiber tract uh, project this, from these um, neurons um, to make uh, connections. And uh, Kwang Hoon, since he moved here, has been trying to further improve um, this clarity technology um, to make the labeling even more even throughout the whole brain and also to shorten the duration of the labeling uh, process. So, um, so I'm going to just show you a couple of movies now uh, we produced using this um, improved te uh, clarity technology. Here we're using this to label um, the FIX FAD uh, mouse model and, um, and the yellow um, is the amyloid plaque. So now I think you have a very good idea about um, the distribution of the amyloid um, in the whole brain level. And we actually also label the mic uh, microvasculature in the brain so you can see um, these blood vessels very, very dense um, uh, throughout the brain. And one can also try to assess the relationship of the plaques and the, the vessels. And one can also label uh, other kind of pathology, uh, such as the microglia, tau. And my last slide is uh, the attempt to use clarity uh, on postmortem human brain samples from Alzheimer's disease subject. And here um, you can see the red color is amyloid plug. And um, this, uh, I should uh, make a point, uh, the previous 5 ID labeling as well as uh, this labeling, we, we use the, the, the um, uh, cell signaling technologies uh, anti-amyloid antibody and this antibody just work really really well in our hand beautifully labeling uh, this uh, amyloid and the yellow here is actually um, labeling of uh, phosphor tau and uh, you can see some of these neurons um, very neurofibrillary um, tangles um, there are several here so um, so um, so I um, I think that um, now we do have this uh, opportunity to um, not just look at two-dimensional uh, pathology but with uh, this kind of uh, 3d labeling we will have for the first time uh, to look at three-dimensional um, brain pathology and assess potential relationship of um, this different molecular pathology or pathological features and um, and I would like to um, end my talk here and um, to have Raphael to do the second part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sai. That was uh, that were fantastic images, and thank you, Vicky. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I will start uh, with a brief overview of CST's portfolio in the field of neuroscience. Then, I will introduce uh, how we validate our antibodies at CST with a few examples. Then, I will dive into more details regarding the antibodies to protein involved in uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and I will end with a few words regarding collaborations between CST scientists and academic researchers. So at CST, we develop antibodies to proteins involved in all aspects of neuroscience, and we organize our portfolio into the following categories. First, the brain function, with neural function that covers the proteins involved in communication or interaction between the different cell types in the brain, the proteins and factors involved in brain development, axonal growth, etc. And then the circadian rhythm, with antibodies to the proteins involved in the circadian clock and their regulators. We also uh, have an uh, interest uh, on the proteins of the synapse with uh, markers of the presynaptic active zone, the postsynaptic density, 
and antibodies to proteins involved in synaptic plasticity, such as phosphocreb, and a growing portfolio of antibodies to neurotransmitters such as NPY, CGRP, and CART. And finally, a, ma a major focus of the neuroscience portfolio is in the field of neurodegenerative diseases with many antibodies to proteins involved in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, sorry, Huntington's and multiple sclerosis. In addition, across all the areas of interest, we focus particularly in developing antibodies that can be used as markers, and there are different types of markers, so uh, cell type markers, for example, so uh, antibodies that will help visualize specific cell types such as neuron with new N, astrocyte with GFAP, uh, oligodendrocyte with CNPAs, and we also can dive uh, more closely into subtypes of neurons, and here I'm showing uh, VGLUT2 for the uh, glutamatergic neurons. Uh, we also uh, have markers to monitor the state of the cells, so uh, we can look at uh, progenitor, like neuronal progenitors with uh, nestin, oligodendrocyte progenitors with A2B5, we can look at dividing cells with KI67 or apoptotic cells with CLIF-PARP, cliff casp 3 and here I'm showing cytochrome C. And finally, subcellular compartment markers. So, for example, uh, markers of the axon with beta-3 tabuline, uh, dendrites with MAP2, uh, and also uh, markers of the presynapse such as the synapsin, synaptophysin, and the postsynapse such as PSD95. So, uh, what is our mission at CST? It is to produce the highest possible quality reagents to support the scientists in their research. And for that, we make sure that every antibody that we release is specific for its target, sensitive in a way that it can detect uh, the targets in endogenous conditions, and reproducible across labs. For that, we produce and validate all our products in-house. So, how do we uh, validate our antibodies? In many cases, for a given protein that is the target of the antibody we develop, we identify expressing and non-expressing cell lines from the literature and from databases, and we screen and validate the antibodies using these positive and negative cell lines as a model. So here, for example, uh, with this CGRP antibody, it is known that CGRP is expressed in TT cells, but not in HILAs. So we use these two cell lines to validate the CGRP antibodies, and as you can see by uh, Western blood and uh, immunofluorescence, the antibody produces a strong and specific signal in the TT cells, but not in the HILAs. Furthermore, the CGRP antibody stains the expected spinal cord layer by immunofluorescence. We also screen and validate our antibodies using cell treatments. So in this case, with uh, neuropeptide Y or NPY, it has been described that upon differentiation with TPA, SHSY5Y cells express increased levels of NPY. So we screened and validated our NPY antibodies using this model by Western blood and immunofluorescence. In addition, a common concern with NPY antibodies is their potential cross-reactivity with peptide YY or PYY. So we tested by Western blood uh, we tested that by Western blood using uh, synthetic NPY, PYY, and PYY336, as you can see in this Western blood, uh, to make sure that our NPY antibody was specific to NPY. Uh, we also often validate our antibodies using high content immunofluorescence screening, and this is particularly useful to discriminate between phospho-specific and non-phospho-specific antibodies. So, uh, in this case, you can see the phosphotau at uh, 416. We assume that the phospho-specific antibody will give a signal only in the conditions that induces phosphorylation. So, we use this method to identify and validate the, this phosphotau antibody by measuring increases in phosphotau levels following uh, amyloid beta-42 peptide treatment of primary mouse cortical neurons. Also, when possible, we try to validate our antibodies using knockout tissues. Here, using a glutamate, uh, a glut D1 uh, KO mouse brain lysate, we confirm the specificity of our glut D12 antibody. So, in some cases, 
when there are not many models available to validate an antibody, we, no we need to be a little more creative. So in the case of the, this shank tooth uh, antibody, we uh, uh, produced and obtained an antibody that exhibited the expected signal by Western blot, but we didn't have access to knockout tissues, and because shank 2 is not found in cell lines, we could not use uh, siRNA to confirm the specificity of our antibody. So since shank 2 is a postsynaptic protein, we decided to carry out a synaptic fractionation experiment to make sure the protein detected by the shank 2 antibody was enriched in the PSD fraction. So as you can see in this western blot, the, uh, the uh, uh, shank 2 signal was uh, enriched in the PSD and absent from the presynaptic active zone, just like PSD95, which further supported uh, the specificity of this shank 2 antibody. We also use a CRISPR-Cas9 mediated knockout in cells. Um, and I'm going to give you a kind of a negative example in this case. So we were working on a BRAP antibody. Uh, the test we uh, carried out on positive versus negative cell line look, uh, looked uh, pretty good, as you can see here, positive in the U251MG and negative in the HS578T. However, we were not really satisfied because of the Western blood pattern and the presence of several bands in the positive cell lines, and we were not really sure about the specificity of these bands. So we generated two knockout lines using CRISPR-Cas9, and found that the, the top band here uh, was also present in the knockout lines, indicating that our BRAP antibody was picking up a non-specific band close to the, the target band. So we decided not to release the antibody because it didn't meet our quality standards. Uh, so now I'm going to go through a quick development story for the uh, development of a uh, amyloid beta uh, pyroglutamate 3 antibody. So, uh, as you may know, the uh, amyloid beta peptides uh, can undergo N-terminal processing by aminopeptidases, and when the N-terminal glutamate is exposed, it can be modified by a glutamine cyclase to generate the PE3 peptide. And so this PE3 peptide has been shown to be abundant in uh, Alzheimer's disease brain and has a high aggregation propensity, stability, and cellular toxicity. It's not detected as a circulating peptide, but only in amyloid plaques, and it has been proposed as a potential target for Alzheimer's disease immunotherapy. So we decided that it would be interesting to develop an antibody to this uh, pyroglutamate 3 amyloid beta peptide. So uh, I'm going to show you how we went about to validate the antibodies. So first we immunized rabbits with the N-terminal part of the uh, amyloid beta P3 peptide. And then to screen for the uh, P3 specific clones, we used uh, synthetic A-beta-42 and uh, P3-42 peptides. Both can be recognized by the A-beta-42 antibody that binds at the C-terminus of the peptide. However, the PE3 specific antibodies will be able to pick up only the uh, PE342 peptide, but not the 1 to 42 peptide. So we also tested the antibodies by immunofluorescence and IHC using brain from control and TG2576 mouse model and human AD postmortem brain sections. So as you can see uh, in immunofluorescence and uh, IHC, uh, we identified several clones that worked well by imaging, and also uh, most of the clones exhibited specificity to the PE3 peptides as seen on this western blot. Uh, furthermore, the specificity of the clones was further tested by dot blot using uh, the PE3 peptide here on the top line, uh, E3 peptide, so just the glutamate not cyclized to make sure that our antibodies are specific to the cyclic form of the glutamate, and a PE scramble peptide to confirm the specificity of, to the pyroglutamate only in the context of the amyloid peptide. So using all these approaches, we identified specific and sensitive clones and were able to release a product validated for IF, IHC, and Western blot. So I'm going to continue with our neurodegeneration portfolio. 
So uh, we are expanding our portfolio in the areas of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's, ALS, and MS. And I will give a few examples. So in addition to the PE3A beta peptide that I just mentioned, uh, using our proprietary antibody technology, we were able to generate uh, antibodies that recognize specifically amyloid beta peptides of different sizes with A beta 42, 40, 39, and 37. And also using an uh, N-terminal epitope, we produced antibodies that recognize all the amyloid beta peptides. And these antibodies have been validated by uh, Western blood, immunofluorescence, and immunohistochemistry. In addition, we found that uh, our uh, D3, D2, and mouse monoclonal antibody is more specific and sensitive than the uh, commonly used uh, clones. We also develop uh, many antibodies to proteins involved in Parkinson's disease. So I'll just show two examples, uh, this uh, anti-pink antibody and this uh, beautiful anti-alpha-synuclein antibody. And we also have uh, uh, products relevant to multiple sclerosis. So uh, we recently released uh, neurofascin antibodies. So an antibody against the neuronal isoform, uh, neurofascin 186, that is located in the node of Ranvier and an antibody to the glial isoform found in the paranodes, as seen here with this mouse sciatic nerve staining. And we just released an antibody against MBP, a major constituent of the myelin shields that stains specifically the oligodendrocytes in these primary cultures. Uh, lastly, I will give a few words about our collaboration efforts with academic researchers through a specific example. So, as you may know, all the scientists at CST come from academia, and therefore we are really invested in helping researchers with their projects. So uh, Jonathan Lipton, a researcher from Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital, whose goal is to elucidate the mechanisms underlying sleep disorders and to understand their link to brain development, identified a new phosphorylation site in BMAL1 that seemed to have a high biological relevance. He needed an antibody to carry out biochemical experiments to confirm his hypothesis, and he contacted CST to collaborate for the development of an antibody to phosphobimal-1. So we were able to produce a phospho-specific antibody that allowed him to finish his study that he published in Cell, and following the publication, we released this phosphobimal-1 antibody. So to conclude, uh, as I mentioned, we have a large portfolio of highly validated neuroscience antibodies. Many of them are relevant to neurodegenerative diseases, and a lot of antibodies have been validated in-house for immunofluorescence and immunohistochemistry. And uh, if you are uh, currently using CST antibodies and you are having any questions, please uh, feel free to contact technical support. We are always happy to help you with your experiments and troubleshoot with you and for your specific experimental designs, because at TST, uh, we strive to be your research partner. So uh, this concludes uh, my presentation, and now we'll have a Q&A session for uh, Dr. Sai and for myself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Now, I would like to invite our audience to continue sending in their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. We have already received some questions, so I will begin with those. So the first question we have today for Dr. Rosenfeld and Dr. Sai is an audience question, and the question is, I will start using 3X TGAD mice for investigating brain connectivity with electrophysiology, and I would like to ask you how good the specific future mouse model is, in your opinion. So um, I personally um, have not used 3XTG um, in, um, in my laboratory. Um, I, um, I do have some colleagues, uh, I think, who have experience with 3XTG. I think that, um, you know, it depends on the purpose of your study. If you would like to have a model with um, both uh, amyloid and tau pathology, then 3XTG is the way to go. On the other hand, my understanding also is that it takes um, a lot longer 
for the pathology to develop in the 3XTG uh, compared to um, the two models that I uh, presented in my presentation, the spikes uh, FAD, um, which, you know, by two to three months, you can already start to see amyloid um, pathology in certain brain regions. Um, and the, the tau p one s is also, I would say, uh, a rather acute mouse model compared to 3XTG. Raphael, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think uh, that was a very complete answer. Perfect. So we'll move on to the second question. And the question is, in the clarity mouse tissue, how do you get the deep penetration of the antibody? And also, what is the volume of the tissue looked at using antibody staining? Yeah, so, um, so first of all, um, I think now, you know, I mean, in the original clarity, it just, you have to incubate with antibody for a very, very long time. But I think now with the improved technology, I believe that Dr. Kwang Hong Chang, he uh, has a manuscript either uh, is uh, accepted for publication or in the pipeline for publication. I think, you know, he, he included um, engineering um, approach um, to both use temperature and um, electrical field to uh, further um, improve um, the uh, the penetration uh, or the distribution of the antibody um, in the deep tissue um, of the brain. And of course, you know, when we talk about uh, whole brain imaging, um, it is it is not um, easy. I mean, one definitely has to have um, um, special, specific um, imaging um, uh, uh, set up um, that's compatible with, you know, whole brain imaging and definitely, you know, um, now I think quite a lot of um, um, uh, microscope um, vendors, they are trying to come up, um, you know, um, optimized um, uh, objects for uh, whole brain imaging. So um, I've seen a couple. Um, you know, I think uh, the imaging part, um, you know, will uh, continue to be um, improved. Perfect. Thank you so much for that answer. The next question we have for you is, can you comment on using CRISPR slash Cas9 technology to validate your antibodies? And do you think it goes far enough? Or are additional validation methods necessary? Okay, so um, I think this, you know, the, uh, this new technology, the CRISPR Cas9 is actually a, a great help for uh, antibody validation because we can uh, generate knockouts in, in cell lines. Um, however, as you probably know, not all proteins are expressed in, in cell lines that we currently use. So there are, especially in neuroscience, there are proteins that will never be found in cell lines that are amenable to the CRISPR Cas9 technology. So we need to have a uh, like an array of uh, different approaches to kind of zero down on the right antibody. So uh, we use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 when we can, but we also, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, try to use uh, knockout tissues or uh, find the proper localization. Uh, so, so we need like uh, multiple uh, approaches to validate the antibodies. Great, thank you. Um, and this is a follow-up question to the previous question I had asked. And the question is, do you feel a clarity on slices would be a mid-step? Um, definitely. Because, as I said, um, you know, the whole brain, you know, labeling is one thing, but um, imaging <laughs> is another. So, um, so I think, um, you know, using a sick brain sections such as one millimeter thick sections um, would be a very good intermediate step. You know, you can already see a lot of three-dimensional, you can get a lot of three-dimensional information already. And if you want to look at, you know, um, relationship of uh, different cell types and, you know, con connectivity, um, 
uh, of the brain or uh, molecular interactions of different pathology of a given disease, uh, the one millimeter section actually can provide a lot of information. And that definitely make um, imaging um, a lot more feasible. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. So we do have a couple of more questions for our speakers today. And the next question is, do you have difficulty looking at multiple targets, the targets multiplexing, with rabbit monoclonal antibodies? Okay, so I guess that's a question for me. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, this is a question that we get often because at CST, uh, most of our antibodies are uh, rabbit monoclonals. Uh, and, you know, these have a lot of advantages, but the uh, the drawback is that it's one species. So uh, as people may not be aware, but we also have uh, mouse monoclonal antibodies for a number of targets, and we also try to identify which antibodies uh, would be uh, used for multiplexing, and we conjugate this with uh, uh, fluorescent probes of uh, different, I mean, different fluorescent probes that would would allow a researcher to uh, multiplex using only uh, rabbit monoclonal antibodies. And if you know uh, some people in the audience have specific needs, they can feel free to reach out to us, and and we uh, always uh, uh, pay close attention to the needs of the community, and we and we try to uh, uh, conjugate. Like for example, antibodies that haven't been conjugated yet, if if we believe that it's going to be really helpful to the community. Perfect, thank you. So we do have one last question for our speakers today, and the question is: What type of microscope may be applied to these immunolabeling methods? Oh, um, I think depending on the purpose. Um, you know, for most of the, um, you know, um, scene section, two-dimensional imaging, just a good confocal uh, microscope, I think is, um, you know, is good. I mean, in my lab, the workforce, um, the workhorse microscope, um, they are always, you know, just very, very good uh, confocal. Um, for three-dimensional, um, whole brain imaging, I think, as I said, some companies, um, they, you know, they have developed, uh, you know, this uh, objective, that, you know, you know, sort of more or less optimized for, um, for um, um, clarity, um, process tissues. Um, but really, I think so far, according to our experience, the light sheet microscopy seems to be really, really ideal for whole brain imaging. Perfect, thank you. Raphael, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. Perfect, well, thank you very much for those answers. We do have one last question for our speakers today, and the question is, does CST have a good available protocol for investigators to pre-conjugate, pre -con pre-conjugate AB prior to multiplexing. Sorry, let me know if you'd need me to repeat that. Uh, well, so that's a good question. So we uh, do, you know, we, we, uh, we do all the conjugation in-house. So we have a, our own protocol. I don't know if it's uh, publicly available. And uh, so we will have to check with the conjugation group. But we also, uh, as I mentioned before, we uh, can always uh, look at the requests and, and, uh, and conjugate in-house for the customers. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. So this does bring us to the end of our webinar and the end of the question and answer portion. And if you do have any further questions, please direct them to the email address showing on your screen. And the email address is marketing at cellsignal.com. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen shortly. Your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Dr. Li Wei Sai and Dr. Raphael Rosenfeld. We hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day everyone.